flow and I'm going to leave you to think about this one and review the structures of the eye. We'll start out by reviewing the disorders of the conjunctiva and the cornea. Most of us know about conjunctivitis uh, or pink eye and our picture over here of the woman with both eyes uh, her left eye has conjunctivitis in it and her right eye is clear. It's not uncommon for only one eye to be affected with conjunctivitis. Um, usually when both eyes are affected it has more to do with little kids rubbing their eye and then infecting the opposite eye as well. It basically is an inflammation of the con conjunctiva, uh, hence the itis at the end of it. Uh, it can be caused by allergies, uh, but most commonly it's caused by bacterial infection. Occasionally it's caused by viruses. Uh, it's treated with topical antibiotics and uh, the big concern with that is to make sure that the eye is clean so that any drainage has been uh, washed away before instilling the antibiotic ointment and it's usually an ointment that's used with it and uh, that the person is careful to not touch the tip of the applicator to the eye uh, because if they do then they will have contaminated it. Normally they'll treat both eyes because of the risk of infection of the opposite eye uh, again from touching it. Uh, with cornea trauma, it is exactly what we talk about. It can be um, uh, either a blunt trauma or it can be actually something sticking into the cornea. The picture of the brown eye right next to the uh, woman has conjunctivus is a corneal trauma and you can see how the uh, cornea has been torn. With cornea edema, which is the picture of the blue eye over here, you can see how there's inflammate or there's uh, swelling of the cornea that's separate from the lens and from the iris. And then um, Keratitis is an infection of the cornea and with this particular picture at the lower left is a fungal infection of the, of the cornea and those would be treated with systemic antibiotics. Most of the time when we think about lens disorders, we think of disorders of refraction and disorders of accommodation. Both of these are fairly benign situations that can be corrected with either LASIK or with corrective lenses. With hyperopia, we're talking about farsightedness. And basically what we're looking at is that whatever image that we're trying to see, the light as it enters into the eye is being focused theoretically behind the retina. Obviously, it can't go through the retina and, and be focused behind it, but if it was able to, that's what would be happening. So the eye is not 
able to take that information and see a clear um, picture. So with correction, then it allows the eye to have that light focused in the correct area of the back of the retina. Uh, with myopia, we have nearsightedness. With it, it's the opposite problem where the, in theory again, this image should be focused in front of the retina, which obviously can't. So what ends up happening is, again, we get a blurred vision and the, uh, with correction, then we can allow the eye to see better. These are the disorders that um, can be corrected with LASIK, as well as astigmatism, which is our uh, next lower picture. And with that, what happens is the lens itself is abnormally shaped. And they use the example of it being oval, but it actually can have little dips and bumps on it so that the light, as it enters the eye, is scattered. And that scattering of the image and the light on the retina causes a blurred and abnormally shaped uh, image. So uh, it also can have correction done so that the person is able to see clearly. It also can be treated with LASIK and uh, that hasn't been something that was able to be done for very long, um, but it, it actually has a correction with LASIK as well. Uh, disorders of accommodation uh, cycloplegia is paralysis of the ciliary muscles and it results in pupil dilation with the loss of accommodation. Presbyopia refers to a decrease in accommodation that occurs with aging. And what happens is that the lens nucleus um, becomes thickened and its capsule becomes less elastic so that the range of focus of a or accommodation is diminished. And as a result, the, begin the person will begin to notice an inability to read small print or to discriminate close objects. And this is usually worse in dim light and on arising in the morning or when the person is fatigued. So what tends to happen with this is the person is reading for a maybe a long period of time, and then when they look up and look in the distance, their eye doesn't accommodate as quickly, and so things off in the distance will appear blurred. Conversely, if they've been doing a lot of stuff on the distance and they become tired and then try to read, then they will notice that their they're not able to focus in on those small words. And this is usually corrected with bifocals. Uh, and that allows the eye to not have to do as much uh, dilation and accommodation. And so they're able to have clear vision both from a distance and up close. This usually starts to happen when people are in their late 40s or early 50s and, um, and can progress as people get older. What's kind of interesting is that you can have the combination of a hyperopia, a myopia, and, a, and a, a astigmatism and have presbyopia. And uh, when they do correction, of uh, the um, with the LASIK, the person would still need to wear glasses because they would still have problems with this accommodation. Cataracts are when there's opacity of the lens. So in other words, it becomes so that it's not clear. 
and you can't see through the lens. And that interferes with the transmission of light to the retina. The most common cause of cataracts is aging, and it normally will start to appear in people uh, in their late 50s and as they go into their 60s. Um, the diagnosis of cataracts is based on an ophthalmic examination and the degree of visual impairment uh, is uh, seen on the Snellen vision test. There's no effective medical treatment for cataracts. In other words, we can't put drops in the eyes or do something like that. So, um, although strong bifocal lenses and magnification and appropriate lighting and visual aids can help, uh, once the cataract gets to a certain stage, surgery is really the only uh, treatment for cataracts. And, um, and I can tell you, you know, I'm, I'm old, I keep telling you all that. Uh, probably about three years ago, uh, they started noticing a small cataract um, on my eye. And uh, I talked to the doctor about, well, what does that mean? Does that mean we have surgery right away? And she's like, well, no, uh, we don't do it until it significantly affects your vision. Uh, because once we do that, there is no going back again with it. And so, um, right now they're watching my little cataract. And when it gets bad enough so that I can't drive at night and I can't uh, see out of my eye, then they'll do surgery on my eye. And basically what they'll do is uh, they'll go in and they will fragment that, cat that lens into tiny little pieces and then they'll aspirate that from the eye and then they suture in an intraocular lens and what's really kind of cool about that is that when they do these surgeries, once they correct, put that corrected lens in there, you can see better than what you've ever seen. And again, these if you had a disorder of refraction so that you needed um, glasses, then they will, they can actually correct that. So you may actually not need glasses afterwards, which is really kind of a cool thing. Uh, so the hyperopia, myopia, or astigmatism can be corrected with that surgery. Um, not one of those things that you want to have happen, but it can be corrected. I talked about the circulation in the eye and it's really kind of an interesting thing because we don't see directly out of the optic nerve we see from the fovea and the macula right next to the optic nerve uh, with the blood vessels running in and out next to the nerve it would make it so that you're uh, your vision would be blocked, so you actually see kind of right next to it. Uh, retinopathy is when there's problems in the small retinal blood vessels. Uh, with microaneurysms, you actually get little outpouchings of these tiny little blood vessels. and The same as what you would get in the brain, only in the eye. Neovascularization is when new vessels, which are more fragile, are formed as a result of hypoxia of the retinal surface. In fact, this is uh, really the cause of why we get the retinal vessels in the first place. 
um, when the baby is still inside of mom, there is a fair amount of hypoxia that's present. If you think about when babies are born, they're just as blue as they can be. It's a relative hypoxia. They have enough oxygenation that is needed for their body inside of mom and to grow and to have uh, the vessels form. The hypoxia is necessary not only for the circulation of the eye, but the circulation of the brain. And this mild hypoxia that's present is what allows these vessels to grow. But what happens with retinopathy is that something has caused a decreased circulation in the retinal surface. And these new ves vessels are stimulated after someone is born or after there's been an injury to the eye. Uh, hemorrhages obviously are something that uh, can happen on the surface of the eye as well and often are related to the microaneurysms uh, bursting. Opacities are the loss of the retinal transparency so it's not clear anymore and you can't see through the opacities. Uh, sometimes they talk about these cotton wool patches which are hazy or irregular outlines that appear with retinopathy. This picture really shows a retinopathy um, that can be caused by either type of um, disease process, but we're going to talk specifically about diabetic retinopathy because it is one of the leading causes of blindness in the Western world, particularly among individuals of working age. Uh, it results from chronic hyperglycemia, hypertension, hypercholesteremia, and smoking. Um, and it, those are all risk factors for the development and the progression of the disorder people with type 1 or insulin dependent diabetes usually do not develop the disorder until at least three to five years after the onset of the disease um, compared to those with type 2 diabetes that they may have retinopathy as their presenting symptom at the time of diagnosis so in other words they already have damage to their eye happening related to undiagnosed diabetes. With non-proliferative retinopathy, it's confined to the retina. Um, it involves engorgement of the retinal veins and thickening of the capillary endothelial basement membrane and the development of capillary microaneurysms. Uh, there are small intraretinal hemorrhages that may develop and microinfarcts that may cause the cotton wool spots and um, leakage of exudates. Uh, the most common cause of decreased vision uh, in persons with background retinopathy is macular edema. So if you think about um, the macula is where you're seeing, so with that edema of the macula, you're not going to be seeing things correctly. Uh, with pro proliferative diabetic retinopathy, it re represents a more severe version of the retinal changes than the background retinopathy. And it's characterized by the formation of new fragile blood vessels. This is that neovascularization. Um, and this happens around the optic disc and can also happen elsewhere in the retina. It's often the first detectable signs of diabetic retinopathy. These vessels grow in front of 
the retina and along the posterior surface of the vitreous or actually into the vitreous. In other words, the vessels aren't staying flat against the surface. They actually are growing up and into the vitreous. And they threaten fission in two ways. First, they often will leak blood in the vitreous cavity and decrease the vitreous acuity. But second, they attach firmly to the retinal surface and the posterior surface of the vitreous chamber so that normal movement of the vitreous humor may exert a pull on the retina and it can cause retinal detachment and progressive blindness. Although, um, and what I want to say about this one is, this is very similar to the retinopathy of prematurity that we see, except the difference here is in adults, it tends to affect their central vision, where the retinopathy of prematurity uh, affects the peripheral vision uh, because those are the vessels that are not developed yet in the infant. And so uh, when this neovascularization takes place, it can cause a retinal detachment out in the peripheral part of the eye. And we're going to talk a lot more about this uh, in PEDS as far as the retinopathy of prematurity. But I just want you to realize that the way that it happens is similar in both types. The proliferative, um, so preventing diabetic retinopathy from developing is the primary treatment. And uh, of course, we want to progress it, uh, keep it from progressing. Uh, is the best way of preserving vision. Uh, there's growing evidence that suggests that careful control of blood glucose levels in persons with diabetes may decrease the onset and the progression of the retinopathy. There's also a need for intensive management of hypertension and hyperlipidemia both of which have been shown to increase the risk of the diabetic retinopathy in persons with diabetes. Retinal detachment happens when the retina separates from the pigment epithelium. Fluid accumulates between the two uh, retinal layers, and there's three different ways that the retina detaches. With the exudative or the serous retinal detachment, it results from accumulation of serous or hemorrhagic fluid in the subretinal space due to, a sevi to severe hypertension, inflammation, or some type of effusion related to cancer. With the traction retin retinal detachment, it occurs when there's mechanical forces on the retina. These are usually mediated by fibrotic tissue resulting from previous hemorrhage of the retina that causes eventual detachment months or even years after the surgery has happened. Uh, correction of traction, retinal detachment requires disengaging the scar tissue from the retinal surface and the vision outcomes are often very poor with these. Regmatogenous detachment is the most common type of retinal detachment and is a full thickness break uh, in the sensory retina with passage of, of a liquefied vitreous through the break into the subretinal space. So in other words, 
that um, vitreous humor is actually um, going through and getting behind the break on the um, on the retina. The primary symptoms of retinal detachment is painless changes in vision. Most commonly what people will say is that they see uh, flashing lights in their vision or they see um, like fireworks inside of their eye or sparks um, which are followed by small floaters and floaters are like spots in the field of vision and those are the early symptoms just after I moved here from Kentucky I was on my way to pick somebody up from the airport and I noticed that I had floaters that I hadn't had before and I was really kind of, I was kind of freaked out by it at first and most floaters are not a major problem uh, they're just funky things that happen as we age but because it was a fairly significant a part of my vision that was being affected by these floaters and I've got some issues that so that I only have one eye that I see well with uh, and of course the floaters happen to be in that eye I saw a retinal specialist and when they uh, saw me after this happened I was going in and seeing them about every two weeks for a while uh, because when they looked at my retina, they could see that there was uh, a hemorrhage on my retinal surface. And the concern was that since it was still bleeding at the time that I saw the retinal specialist, that I still had a risk of having my retina detach. Since I don't see central vision off of the other eye this would co potentially cause me to go blind so uh, like I said they watched it for a long period uh, period of time uh, for about six or eight weeks they were watching it every two weeks and then once the hemorrhage stopped then they watched it every three months and then um, that's spaced out to every six months which is where I am right now where every six months I go in and see the retinal specialist to make sure that the fibrotic changes that could happen from that bleeding in my eye is not causing my retina to detach Um, usually what people see when there's detachment is that they'll, it will look like a shadow or a dark curtain is uh, progressively crossing the visual field because the area that detaches is crossing over where is crossing over the fovea or the um, macula and that's what they're sensing as this darkness that's going across it. Uh, large peripheral detachments can occur without involving the macula and if the macula is unaffected then vision will not be affected. There are ways for them to go in and do laser surgery uh, to uh, make that detachment reattach um, but the peripheral vision is normally lost in that case when that happens.
Macular degeneration is characterized by degenerative changes in the central portion of the retina, specifically the macula, that results in primarily a loss of central vision. Age-related macular degeneration is commonly classified as early or late. Um, late age-related macular degeneration is further subdivided into graphic atrophy or dry um, atrophy and neovascular or wet. Although both late forms are progressive and usually bilateral, they differ in their manifestations, prognosis, and management. And it actually, although they talk about both of them being bilateral, it's not especially unusual for somebody to only have it in one eye. The geographic at, at atrophy degeneration is characterized by gradually progressive visual loss of moderate severity due to atrophy and degeneration of the outer retina and the retinal pigment epithelium. So what you have to realize when we're talking about all of these things is that there's three layers of the retina and so two layers of the retina are being um, involved. Because it does not involve leakage of blood or serum, it's referred to as dry macular degeneration. So people with this form of AMD need to be followed closely because the neovascular form may develop suddenly at any time. Because again, when you have degeneration and you have hypoxia of that tissue, neovascularization is stimulated and can uh, cause a more severe form and result in retinal detachment. The neovascular form of AMD is characterized by the formation of a choroidal neovascular membrane. So in other words, we've got this, this membrane with, with these fragile vessels in them. These new blood vessels have weaker walls than normal and are more prone to leaking. So this form is called wet because these vessels are leaking or, or hemorrhaging. Over time, the subretinal hemorrhages organize to form scar tissue, and the scar tissue uh, is a sign that there's been death um, to that level. And then because it's thicker, it doesn't allow oxygen to get to the lower level tissues and it causes death to the underlying retinal tissue and loss of all visual function uh, in, the, in that area of the macula. And although some subretinal neovascular membranes may regress spontaneously, the natural course is towards an irreversible loss of central vision. So my mother has macular degeneration. And what I've observed, and she has the wet version, is over the last few years, her vision has become increasingly poor. Uh, the last time I talked with her and saw her in June, uh, she said that she all she could see is shadows. That, uh, and she went from being able to see peripherally pretty well, and she basically was functioning pretty well uh, with her peripheral vision because you can see pretty well with that, um, but. Now, because of the progression of her macular degeneration, she's seen less and less well and really is pretty much blind at this point in time, although she would tell you that she still can see.
The aqueous humor is formed by the ciliary body. It then passes from the posterior chamber through the pupil. In the anterior chamber, it delivers food and oxygen to the lens and the cornea. Then it drains through the trabecular meshwork uh, and the endocorneal angle between the iris and the cornea. And from that, from that trabecular meshwork, it drains into the canal of Schlem. And this is important to know as we talk about some of the disorders that we're going to talk about next. Glaucoma is an increased pressure inside of the eye, and that increased pressure over time can cause blindness because the pressure decreases the blood flow to the retina. Uh, what happens with the open angle glaucoma is the iridocorneal angle remains open but the trabecular meshwork abnormally decreases the rate of the aqueous humor reabsorption. And this results in gradual buildup of the aqueous humor and uh, the increased pressure in the eye. Angle closure glaucoma is when the angle is closed so that the aqueous humor cannot flow into the trabecular meshwork. The iris slowly is displaced forward, usually due to the iris thickening caused by pupil dilation. There becomes a rapid buildup of the aqueous humor in the anterior chamber and again this puts pressure on the retinal vessels which affect vision. So the way that this is treated is through drops uh, primarily and these eye drops are not cheap. They're very expensive. Um, <laughs> my mother <laughs> who has glaucoma as well as her macular degeneration, buys the little tiny bottles that are, you know, when I say tiny, the bottle itself is probably an inch in height and about as thick as your thumb and in diameter. And, um, each one of those bottles of eye drops costs around $90 to $120. Uh, so you can understand, since glaucoma tends to affect um, people that are older, you can understand how difficult it is for people to afford their medications because one of those bottles lasts about, um, if I remember right, a month or two months, something like that. And so if you're having to buy a medication that's going to cost $100 every month and you're dependent on your Social Security, which really is only paying enough just barely for your housing and utilities, you can see why people sit there trying to figure out, am I going to eat am I, or am I going to buy my medications? Uh, so it's definitely one of those things that has to be considered when we start talking about people being non-compliant is their ability to pay for their medications. We're going to move on to the ear. Uh, here's your picture to remind you of the normal um, anatomy of the, of the ear. And uh, you definitely have your book or online sources to review the function of the ear.
the way this sound is conducted in the ear, the external ear conducts sound waves to the eardrum. And that's where we get a mechanical vibration. The eardrum um, moves back and forth, and that's the mechanical vibrate how the mechanical vibrations are made. Inside of the middle ear, it conducts the mechanical vibrations from the eardrum to the oval window, and that's where we start getting fluid waves. The eustachian tubes let air in and out of the middle ear to maintain equal pressure on both sides of the eardrum. Uh, we've all experienced what happens as we go up in the airplane and that um, air pressure is not equal on both sides of the eardrum and we have that feeling of fullness in our ears. In the inner ear, it conducts the fluid wave through the cochlea to the receptor hair cells, which make a, an electrical and chemical signal. The fluid waves and the hair cells in the semicircular canals and the vestibule respond to changes in head position and movements in equilibrium, not sound or hearing. Some of the most common disorders of the ear are these middle ear disorders. Uh, with anastasian tube disorders, there may be abnormal patency, meaning that the tube itself hasn't formed correctly during fetal or embryonic life. Uh, or there may be an obstruction. The most common obstruction occurs when people have upper respiratory infections and there is inflammation of the eustachian tube causing a, an, a partial obstruction and in some cases uh, even a full obstruction and doesn't allow the fluid to drain from the middle ear. This can result in inflammation of the middle ear, we call that otitis media. Uh, if the fluid is unable to drain, then we get otitis media with effusion. Uh, we used to treat these just automatically with antibiotics, but most otitis media is caused by a viral infection, usually an upper respiratory infection. Uh, if the fluid is not able to drain from the ear, because the eustachian tubes are blocked, they can develop a secondary infection that needs to be treated with antibiotics. If people, particularly children, have what they would call a chronic otitis media, meaning that they have multiple ear infections over a six months to one year period of time, then they often will have tubes put in and the tubes allow this fluid to drain easily out of the inner ear chamber. The other thing that we have to think about is what is causing the obstruction of the eustachian tube in the first place. So if there is a problem with the eustachian tube itself, they may um, fix that obstruction. But uh, one of the most common causes of eustachian tube uh, obstruction is tonsils. And so often when kids get tubes put in their ears, they'll also take out their tonsils. Um, with my oldest daughter, she had tubes put in her ears and they took out her adenoids. And they left her other tonsils in because your tonsils have a purpose. Uh, but her problem was that her adenoids were blocking off her eustachian tubes. So they took out her adenoids and basically that fixed her problem. Uh, and then her tubes were removed about a year and a half or two years later. 
um, one of her tubes actually just fell out and the hole just healed up by itself over time. And the other tube, they had to manually remove from her ear. The complications of having otitis media can be mastoiditis, uh, which is a, a inflammation of the mastoid bo um, bone. Uh, so that's a major issue there. Uh, the other is this cholesterostoma, which can actually cause permanent hearing loss. The other thing that can happen is they can have formation of this new spongy bone, which is caused, called otosclerosis, which actually causes the bones in that are associated with hearing not to move. Uh, the treatment of otosclerosis can be medical or surgical. The medical treatment is to get a well-fitting hearing aid that allows that person with this conductive deafness to hear more normally. Um, the surgical treatment is to allow this bone to move uh, better again. When we look at the inner ear and the auditory pathway disorders, one of the problems that is very common is increased nerve fire firing, which is associated with tinnitus. Tinnitus is the perception of abnormal ear or head noises that are not produced by an external stimuli. Although it's often described as ringing in the ears, it can also make a, a hissing a roaring, a buzzing, or a humming sound. Uh, tinnitus can be constant, so that noise is there all the time. It can be intermittent. It can be unilateral or bilateral. The condition affects both sexes equally, um, and it tends to be more prevalent between the ages of 40 and 70. Uh, occasionally, it affects children but that's a little more rare. Um, so what happens with tinnitus um, is that we can get a mild high-pitched tinnitus that lasts for several minutes. Uh, it's just a normal thing that happens in, in our hearing. Uh, it can be impacted by cerumen, uh, and that's a very benign reason for it, basically clean out the earwax and it goes away. There's medications like aspirin and stimulants like nicotine and caffeine that can cause a transient uh, tinnitus. Uh, there's some medications that can actually cause a prolonged or permanent uh, tinnitus as well. Most of the medications that cause tinnitus, once you stop them, the tinnitus goes away. However, that is, sometimes the tinnitus is a sign of early hearing loss that's been affected by these medications. Some of the conditions um, that are associated with persistent tinnitus includes noise-induced hearing loss, uh, pressed by which is sensorineural hearing loss that occurs with aging. Remember that, you know, presbyopia um, with, with um, visual losses associated with aging. Well, now we've got another one that's starting out with that presby uh, suffix, prefix, I'm sorry. Uh, of the word. So press by means an age-related um, problem. So in this case, uh, hearing loss, uh, hypertension, atherosclerosis, head injuries, and cochlear or labyrinth infections or inflammation all can be uh, medical reasons why somebody would get tinnitus. 
Treatment measures for tinnitus are designed to reduce the symptoms. Uh, there really is not a cure for it. And um, so if you eliminate the drugs or other substances like caffeine, uh, some cheeses, wines, and foods that contain monosodium glutamate um, are suspected in causing tinnitus. Um, tinnitus retraining therapy includes uh, directive counseling and the extended use of a low noise generator. So in other words, we're, we're treating the noises that we're hearing in our ears with noise. Um, and that helps the person to um, adjust to the tinnitus. Uh, and that's um, had pretty good success. Um, my ex-husband was an audiologist, and so every once in a while I'd hear him come home and talk about uh, somebody that he treated with one of these noise-making hearing aids, which just didn't make sense to me. But um, the tinnitus is an annoying sound, and so this noise that's there helps you sort of ignore the tinnitus and you and it's not an obnoxious noise like the tinnitus tends to be. Uh, decreased nerve fi firing is associated with sensorineural deafness and press bicussis and we're going to talk a little bit about those as well. Hearing loss is measured in decibels and the level of hearing is um, of zero is considered to be a threshold for the perception of sound at a given frequency in persons with normal hearing. So as strange as it sounds, zero doesn't mean no sound at all. But most people can't hear anything at zero. Um, Ten is like the sound of a leaf falling. Uh, so it kind of gives you an idea of a comparison there. Uh, a tenfold increase in sound pressure levels from 0 to 20 um, is considered a significant hearing loss in children because of their need for hearing to be able to speak. However, uh, a 20, the sound at 20 decibels is like um, the leaves rustling in trees. So we're not talking about a huge amount of sound with it. Uh, the humming of a refrigerator is 45 decibels. Uh, normal conversation is 60 decibels. Uh, noise from heavy traffic is around 85 decibels. Uh, motorcycles are about 95 decibels. An MP3 player at maximum volume is about 105 decibels. Uh, sirens from police cars or from fire trucks is around 120 decibels. And firecrackers and fire firearms, so that that popping sound that we hear if we're up close is 150 decibels. So it give you, gives you a general idea of uh, what uh, the sound levels are. Uh, hearing loss is classified as mild if somebody has a 26 to 40 decibel loss. It's considered moderate from 41 to 55 severe from 71 to deci 90 decibel loss, or profound if they have a 91 decibel or greater uh, loss of hearing. Hard of hearing is defined as hearing loss between 20 and 25 in adults and greater than 15 in children. Profound deafness is defined as hearing loss that's greater than 90 in adults and 62 or 70 decibel loss in children. The chart on um, page 981 
has uh, the causes for hearing loss. Uh, so you can kind of look at that and get some ideas about that. Hearing loss is further divided into conductive or sensorineural neural loss. Conductive hearing loss is a more permanent cause of hearing loss uh, from thickening or damage of the tympanic membrane or involvement of the bony structure, the ossicles and the oval window of the middle ear um, that's caused by otosclerosis or Paget's disease. And basically the stimulation is just not conducted to the inner ear. Sensorineural neural or perceptive hearing loss occurs with disorders that affect the inner ear, the auditory nerves, or the auditory pathways of the brain. And with this type of deafness, the sound waves are conducted to the inner ear, but there's abnormalities of the cochlea or the auditory nerves that, dis that they decrease or that distort the transfer of the information to the brain. Abnormal function resulting from damage or malformation of the central auditory pathways and circuitry is included in this category. Presbycusis is used to describe degenerative hearing loss that occurs with advancing age. Um, we talked about how this word presby, um, this prefix in front of um, a different ending means that it's age associated. There's a number of infections that can cause sensorineural hearing loss and it's most commonly caused by viral infections or circulatory disorders. And the treatment for these can be um, hearing aids, or in some cases, if it's a cochlear um, problem, they may need to do a cochlear implant. And um, these implants really have changed the ability of people that previously were thought to be permanently deaf and have allowed them to be able to hear. Now, you know, in some cases, these um, cochlear disorders can be genetic or, or congenital problems. And so, you know, here's, there's a lot of pictures out on the internet of little babies hearing their mother's voice for the first time. And this sudden um, change in their demeanor because they're hearing these, these sounds. So it's a pretty cool thing. Finally, we're going to talk about vertigo or this sensation that you're moving when you're not. And this is also a function of the ear. Um, located on the inside surface of each uterocral and saccule uh, inside the ear is a small sensory area about two millimeters in diameter that, called the macula that responds to our sense of static equilibrium. Each macula is a flat epithelial patch that contains supporting cells and sensory hairs, uh, which um, take those stimuli to the vestibular nerve. And these hair cells are embedded in a gelatinous mass and then there is something called an otolith membrane, which is studded with a whole bunch of tiny little stones that are made out of calcium carbonate uh, crystals, and they're called otoliths. And as the head is tilted, this gelatinous mass shifts its position because of the pull of gravity and it bends the cilia of the macular hair cells um, 
and it's called benign prox proximal positional vertigo and it's this sensation of whirling or spinning motion and um, it's when the otoliths become dislodged from their gelatinous base that they cause vertigo that's precipitated by changes in your head and we're going to be talking about those uh, with vertigo there is objective vertigo and then there's subjective and vertigo can be something that somebody else can sense and see why it's happening that's the objective version and then the subjective is when it's just you motion sickness is one form of vertigo and it just means that there's an illusion of motion um, and with that they may feel like the the room is spinning or um, there's a to and fro motion or um, or that they're falling with Meniere's disease which is a more uh, severe version of it it's characterized by fluctuations um, of tinnitus uh, feelings of ear fullness and violent rotary vertigo that occur often renders the person unable to sit or to walk because just sitting up will make them feel like things are spinning around and they're going to throw up. Um, they basically have to lay quietly with their head fixed in a comfortable position and avoiding all head movements because that aggravates the vertigo. Uh, some of the symptoms can be referred to the autonomic nervous system so they may uh, be pale, they may sweat, they may have nausea and vomiting. Uh, the more severe the attack, the more severe the autonomic manifestations. The methods used to diagnose Meniere's disease include audiograms and vestibular testing using electronystigmatography and um, Petra's pyramid radiographs. The administration of hyperosmolar substances like glycerin and urea often produce temporary and acute temporary hearing improvement in persons with Meniere's disease and sometimes it's used as a diagnostic measure of, um, for that. The diuretic furosemide, which is Lasix, also may be used for that purpose. The management of Meniere's disease focuses on an attempt to reduce the distension of the endolymphatic space and can be done medically or surgically. The pharmacologic management uh, consists of suppressant drugs um, like Prochlorobacillus perazine, um, promethazine, or diazepam, which acts centrally to decrease the activity of the vestibular system. Diuretics are used to reduce the endolymph fluid volume, uh, and a low sodium diet is recommended in addition to those medications. Uh, the steroid hormone prednisone may be used to to maintain satisfactory hearing and resolve the dizziness. An intratympanic genomycin therapy has been used for ablation of the vestibular system. There are some cases where um, this vertigo is actually caused by trauma. So if somebody has had um, head trauma, it's possible for these otoliths to get displaced and with their displacement they get to this vertigo and the treatment that they do to relieve that is to actually sit there and vib 
put the head in various positions and vibrate the head so that these otoliths return to where they're supposed to be. And with that treatment, it causes their vertigo to go away. Um, I will say that a lot of these tests to diagnose the Meniere's disease or looking at the vertigo actually makes these people violently sick. And uh, so it's not the most pleasant of treatments, but it does help with it.